I can, I can already tell you guys like my wife more than you like me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Rector, for, for that kind introduction. Uh, to President Ryan, to the Board of Visitors, distinguished faculty, to the proud alumni, and most importantly to the members and guests of the University of Virginia class of, of 2019. Thank you so much for this blessing and this honor to join you today for this momentous occasion. I have to admit, I'm, I'm overwhelmed right now. Um, this weekend has been a long time coming for so many of us. And you just think about the hours that were invested, all the time spent, the long nights that became early mornings. You think about the countless moments of anticipation and excitement that sometimes turned into disappointment and frustration. Think about the incredible twists and turns that we've seen along the way. Think of how you've watched people grow and evolve, uh, sometimes for the better, but let's be honest, sometimes for the worse. But now this weekend is finally here, and we all together get to answer the most pressing question of all. What the heck is gonna happen on the series finale of Game of Thrones? <laughs> and who's gonna sit on the Iron Throne? I'm confused, I'm confused. Um, also of mild importance, you guys are graduating. Uh, but, and, and that's really, really exciting as well. This has been a long time coming for, for so many of you and incredibly proud, not just of you, but let's hear it one time for the bicentennial class of 2019, but also for your village, for the family and, and friends who helped you along the way. Congratulations to you all. Now, as, as a UVA alum, it's impossible to be here on the lawn for finals weekend and, and to not really soak this in and, and be transported back to your own graduation. And the commencement speaker of my year was Dr. Vivian Penn. She's a renowned physician and scientist, a longtime leader at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, she absolutely has earned her place in the pantheon of, of great UVA alum. She even has a building named after her over at the School of Medicine. And, and yeah, for Dr. Penn. And, and in the years after my graduation, I'm blessed to have forged a friendship with Dr. Penn. And a couple of weeks ago, I reached out. Uh, we had a chance to connect and, and talk about her own experience as the commencement speaker. It gave me an occasion to look back at her remarks 14 years later with fresh eyes and to see what, what really I could lift from that now some years removed from graduation. What I, what I found was something that really struck me, a particular paragraph where Dr. Penn was describing the Human Genome Project and the sobering realization that we humans have roughly the same number of genes as fruit flies. Now, that being said, she still reminded us of a really important human characteristic that differentiates us from fruit flies. There are a couple, but <laughs> the one in particular. We can learn from the past, we can live in the present, and we can keep an eye on the future, she said. So here, 14 years after she made those remarks, I believe that this moment, this day, this graduation accomplishment is best experienced through the lens of that uniquely human relationship with time. Today, as you punctuate another transition out of one phase of life and into another, you have the rare opportunity to seamlessly connect with who you were, who you are, and who you will be. For those of you in the college, I want to take you back to the last time that you were all gathered together here on the lawn. That was Sunday, August 23rd, 2015, 1,364 days ago. You were all sitting on this lawn for your opening convocation and honor induction. Now, the arrangement was a little different. You were turned around and you were facing the rotunda, the, the temple of knowledge for our little academical village. You may also remember that there was a gift that was left on your seat. It was a, a gift from the UVA Alumni Association, and it was a shiny new nickel, sort of like this one. Now, I know what you're thinking. When it comes to Thomas Jefferson currency, $2 bills are way cooler. <laughs> but nickels are actually super cool also. Uh, like, trust me on this one, okay? And the first thing is they're the only American coin with a forward-facing presidential bust on the coin. Secondly, the name is a little bit misleading because they're only 25% nickel, but 75% copper. They should be called a copper. 
Next, they actually cost more to produce than they're worth. They cost about 7.5 cent to produce, and they're worth five cent. And then my favorite is how for the past 14 years, it's illegal to melt down nickels or to transport more than $5 worth of nickels out of the country. And that's because of the rising costs of copper and nickel, and uh, they don't want us realizing that they're, more worth, they're worth more as melted down metal than as actual nickels. Coins in general are cool. The study of, of coins is called numismatics. And real quick, how many, sides of there are, are, how many sides of a coin are there? You're wrong. You're loud and wrong. <laughs> there are three sides of a coin. The front side is the obverse. That's heads. It's the face of a coin. The, the back side is, is called the reverse. Uh, that's tails. And the third side is often forgotten. It's that edge that runs circumferentially all around the coin. So why did I just spend so much time telling you about nickels and coins? Well, it's because you can get a lot out of this moment, out of this day, the, your graduation from UVA, if you think about it being a lot like that nickel you got at opening convocation. On the obverse, on the front side, you got the portrait of Mr. Jefferson, kind of that figure of our university that you're staring squarely in the face. On the reverse, on the back side, you're looking at Monticello. That's the manifestation of the life that Mr. Jefferson had the vision, the creativity, and the drive to create for himself. That's where you're headed. That's where you will be. But on that third side, on the edge, it's completely blank. It's seemingly only a transition space from one side to the other. But when you stand that nickel up, or you spin that nickel around, you realize there's actually some substance there. Today, in this moment, I want you to realize that you guys are standing on the edge of a nickel, and that there's a lot of power and potential in this space. As Dr. Penn put it, living in this moment means that you're simultaneously having the opportunity to learn from your past while keeping an eye on your future. Let's start with learning from your past. How can you use this moment to reflect on your years on these grounds and really connect with their impact on you? What did you glean from your time staring Mr. Jefferson and his university squarely in the face? Now, I had the honor of living in a dorm named Webb in my first year at UVA. It's named for the same person for whom Watson Webb is named today. I was the Webb in Webb. But I say that it was an honor because that dorm is named after my great-great-grandfather. I'm just playing, y'all. That's not true. <laughs> it's completely and utterly false. I have no known familial relationship with Professor Robert Henning Webb. And <laughs> but, but that's a little alternative fact that I used to tell my sweet mates back in 2001. <laughs> I bring up Webb Dorm and I bring up my sweet mates because a, a big part of where you have been these last few years is building really important relationships with others through shared experiences, through commiseration, and sometimes through long-running inside jokes. Like how I met Oren on a basketball court in, in Slaughter, and six years later, he was the first person I asked to be a groomsman in my wedding. Or how I met Mia in my peer advising group through the OAAA, and, and years later when she had her daughter, she did me the honor of asking me to be one of Neve's godfathers. Or, or Leanne, who lived in Dunglison. She's the girl who I begged to study with me for chemistry because she was so smart and studious and good looking. And, and how Leanne is now my bride of 10 years next week and, and how she's the mother of our two children. The, the bonds that you have built, that's right. The bonds that you have built through your relationships will continue to deepen with time if you only continue to value them and nurture them like you have during these years. Now, beyond socializing, there was certainly an education for you here at the University of Virginia. In fact, back when you arrived, that's the only thing that you knew for certain that you were going to receive. Now, you may not have known precisely in which subject you would study, but you knew that you could reasonably expect that in these years, you would have some depth of exposure in some field of inquiry. But today, as you look back, at where you were. What did you learn over these years? Not your scores on exams or the masterful papers you wrote, not what's on your transcript, but what did you actually learn? Through your coursework, you tackled the substance of what would become your 
degrees in government or economics, African American studies or anthropology, sociology or psychology. But each semester, every day, through your struggle and your success, your challenge and your commitment, you earned so much more. You earned a degree of humility and a degree of sacrifice, a degree of perseverance and a degree of thankfulness, a degree of self-reliance and a degree of self-awareness, a degree of swagger and a degree of sophistication. While you deepened your knowledge in your respective fields, you actually sharpened the person you were into the person you are. Finally, what did you accomplish while you were here? What was your UVA legacy? Hey, buddy. We all inhabit these spaces on grounds for but a moment. Just a moment. And we're fiduciaries of an ethos. We are stewards of our university's ideals. And in the time you all were here, you led, you created, you helped UVA evolve into its next and better self. You stood united against hatred and bigotry. And you spoke up for greater inclusion and awareness. You helped make history energizing our men's basketball team along their path to becoming national champions. You, you did these things not as individuals, but you did them as a collective body. You, you proved the power of collective purpose and passion. So when you look at the diploma you'll receive in a couple of hours, remember all that it truly stands for. Remember how you walked on these grounds surrounded by complete strangers, but you left with new family members and lifetime friends. Remember how you turned tragedy into triumph, showing the world time and again who we are and what we stand for. Remember how you came in full of potential, but walked out as scholars and innovators, as activists and champions. Remember that this chapter of your life is closing, but this ceremony is called commencement because this is just the beginning. Remember that you are just getting started. Next up, let's, let's talk about today. Let's discuss where you're currently situated in this moment, that standing on the edge of a nickel, the space you can easily overlook and to which you don't often pay attention, but that space that has more substance and function than you realize. There's a word that I use not infrequently in my time as a medical anthropology major here at UVA. That word is liminality. It's derived from the Latin word meaning threshold, and it's the transitional period or phase of a rite of passage during which the participant lacks social status or rank, they remain anonymous, they show obedience and humility, and they follow prescribed forms of conduct, conduct, dress, etc. Look at yourselves. Herded onto this lawn, wearing these formless gowns and these awkward, though expertly decorated caps. This is liminality. And one thing that's well accepted is that in those liminal moments, there's a transformational power in those transitional periods, if only you recognize the moment. In the years since I graduated from UVA, I've had a, quite a few transitions, from undergrad to grad school, from grad school to med school, med school to law school, law school back to med school, med school to residency, residency to the White House. Are you confused about what I've been doing with my life? Sometimes I am too. Um, but I want to focus on one transition in particular to help really illustrate how powerful these moments can be if you really focus on them. Now you heard earlier that I was a White House Fellow, but that only tells part of the story because I was actually a White House Fellow in a presidential transition year in 2016 to 2017. So I walked into the White House knowing that there was going to be a change in my Commander in Chief. For those first five and a half months, working in the Obama administration was absolutely amazing. In my work on President Obama's My Brother's Keeper initiative, I had the opportunity to do some really great and important work but to also meet some really incredible people. I had meetings with Kobe Bryant and Eric Holder, and Jay Ellis, Kofi Cerebo, Al Sharpton, Eric Holder, D.L. Hughley, the entire Detroit Pistons basketball team. Now, I did meet with some non-black people too, but I'm doing this for the culture right now, so. Um, <laughs> You know, you know, one week I even had the opportunity to meet with President Obama four times in the same week. It was incredible. After the election, I knew along with the rest of America that I was in for a pretty significant change. So I spent the next few weeks preparing myself for the transition, as I had learned to do so many times before. Then on the night before inauguration, I spent time just sitting in the West Wing, wandering around, talking with folks, 
soaking in the moment, but also thinking. I reflected on my values and my grounding principles. I thought through scenarios where I could still have an impact and still meet cool people. But more than anything, I grounded myself in a sense of duty, knowing that my passion and my voice for social justice could be my greatest contribution to the building once the Trump administration began in January. Now, harnessing that liminality, focusing on that, in on that transition completely, that held me down. It grounded me through the very first day of the Trump administration when my office was cleaned out, all my belongings thrown away because they thought I was leaving with the rest of the Obama administration. Or, or it steadied me when they moved my desk out into the hallway and wouldn't allow me to come into the office with everyone else because they were dealing with sensitive matters. It sustained me in those six weeks that I spent sitting in a hallway being told every day that they didn't have any work on which I could help. Finally, two months later, in March, I found an office where I could contribute, where I was valued as a colleague and where I forged genuine friendships in the Domestic Policy Council. I worked on drug pricing and I, I even worked to find ways to continue some of the important work from the Obama administration in My Brother's Keeper. But without my reflection in the midst of that transition, without grounding myself somewhere between Obama and Trump, I never would have made it to that point. And more than that, I never would have known how to be myself and have an impact once I got there. Now, while that example focuses on a unique type of transition, most of your transitions are gonna take you from one state to another. And in that process, you're often gonna acquire something on the other side of that transition. It may be a degree, it may be a title, it may be a higher salary, or it may be some privilege. Oh, snap, here we go. <laughs> Commencement speaker's about to break down white privilege, it's gonna be real. <laughs> and while while racial and gender and body privilege are unique in that they can be assessed by appearance alone, the truth is that we all need to have an ear to listen when we talk about the role of privilege in shaping experiences in this country. Keep in mind that in addition to my being black, you are looking at a young, cisgendered, heterosexual, non-disabled, Christian American man with two professional degrees who grew up in a two-parent household. There's a lot of privilege that I have that I have to be aware of. So for the purposes of this morning, let's operate on the premise that privilege is privilege, and you will acquire your newest form of privilege in just a few hours. You're gonna have the privilege that comes with being a college graduate. And I know you're looking at me like, huh, I got the privilege of these loans. <laughs> you might even balk at my use of the term privilege because of how hard you worked to earn it, and I get that. But the truth is that the privilege that comes with being a college graduate, it, plays out in a lot of unexpected places. After all, only 31% of adults over the age of 25 have a bachelor's degree. That's less than one in three. And compared to a high school graduate, you're half as likely to be unemployed, and you're gonna earn about $22,000 more per year, an income gap that's actually gonna grow with time. In a couple of hours, you're gonna become 11% more likely to own a home, and you're actually gonna gain six additional years of life expectancy compared to a high school graduate. The privilege that I'm describing with regard to your identity as newly minted college graduates is that society gives you an outsized benefit for that status. More than that, it gives you that benefit often at the expense of someone else's opportunity or well-being, and cycles continue. So in this transitional period, in this last phase of your rite of passage, in the midst of your liminality, what will you do? What transformational energy will you harness? What commitments to yourself will you make as you learn from your past and look to your future? Will you be willing to set aside your newest privilege and instead stand up, speak out, and commit yourself to prioritizing equality and justice? The choice will always be yours, but how will you act? Who will you be? And that brings us to the final side of our coin, the reverse, the back side, tails. Now going back to our nickel, that's the side with the depiction of the west facade, the iconic back of Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. Just as Jefferson spent over four decades designing, dismantling, and reimagining his estate, how will you conceive, execute, and inhabit the future that awaits you? Now I wanna build on this historic symbolism of UVA commencement for a moment. We talked about how at your opening convocation you were turned facing the rotunda, 
And today, you sit facing the opposite direction. If you remove Old Cabell Hall and the South Lawn from today's backdrop, you realize that the notion was to have you facing outward into the world that awaits you. Now, the road ahead will not always look like those paved streets uh, behind you, like Emmett Street or University Avenue. They won't always be lined with the comfort, convenience, and fun of the corner. Instead, the road ahead will look a lot like the environment that's surrounded you through your years in Charlottesville, like these Blue Ridge Mountains. Now, believe me, there will be mountains ahead. Not a single indomitable mountain, but a series of seemingly sloping hills, sometimes beautiful scenery from a distance, but often tiring and treacherous when you try to traverse them. Now, I remember one particular mountain just before I came to UVA in 2017. No, not, not figuratively, it was really a mountain. Um, I was on a trip to South Africa with a group of White House fellows, and we went to do a hike on Lion's Head Mountain in Cape Town. It has a summit of about 2,200 feet, takes about 90 minutes to hike. The way up was fantastic. I was surrounded by friends, full of energy, taking in the scenery. We, we get to the top and snap some pictures, post on Instagram, done and done. But shortly after starting the hike back down, I, I get to a scramble and I carelessly go to descend. I slip, I tumble down the scramble, about 30 or 40 feet or so. My careening body amazingly comes to a stop two feet from the edge of the mountain. As I lay there in pain and disbelief, a French passerby mutters something about me being a stupid American. I get up, I dust myself off, and I limp back down the mountain, feeling absolutely awesome. But I learned something from that tumble. Something hit me, and I'm not talking about one of the many rocks that hit me on the way down. I realized that I slipped and fell because I was wearing a pair of old Nike fly nets that had no grip. That I moved too quickly and too carelessly on the way down. That, that falling felt terribly, and that next time I would be better prepared. I realized that when it comes to mountains, you really have to know how to climb or else you're more likely to fall. These mountains ahead of you are similar. You have to know how to climb and with what tools or else you're more likely to fall. Let's be real, you're gonna fall sometimes anyway, but what can you do to minimize that risk or to make your tumble a little more forgiving? Now on their website, REI has the 10 essentials for safety, survival, and basic comfort for climbing mountains. When we're talking about real mountain climbing, not hiking small things that I still couldn't do without injury. Their list includes navigation like a map or a compass, sun protection, insulation, illumination, first aid supplies, fire, a repair kit and tools, nutrition, hydration, and an emergency shelter. If you are new to mountain climbing, this list or one likes it, like it seems like a pretty good place to start to give you your best chance for success. Well, for you, I wanted to offer a few recommendations as the tools you can take with you as you navigate the mountains ahead. I feel blessed to have achieved what I have over these last 14 years since UVA, and I wanted to give you the BCW guide on how to climb. First, be authentic. It's a, it's a lot like navigation, actually. Know your true north. When you come to a fork in the road, you have multiple opportunities in front of you or when you have a difficult decision to make about how to move forward in new or challenging spaces, keep in mind that you never have regrets if you stay true to yourself, true to your values, and true to your dreams. Second, find mentors. I think this would be the illumination on REI's list. And while there's no other person who shares all the unique components that make you you, there are always people who have climbed mountains before you and who can give you some insight on how to best tackle yours. Do yourself a favor, keep those folks around to help light your path. Believe me, you'll save yourself a lot of time by avoiding the missteps they made when they climbed. Third, iterate. It's kind of a mix of those first aid supplies and the repair kit and tools. Like I said before, you're going to fall. You'll take your lumps, and both you and your tools may seem broken at times. But in order to move forward, you have to patch them. You have to patch yourself up and try again. You've already learned that nothing worth having comes easily. And as you push farther and farther, you have to remember to take care of yourself, 
to adapt on the fly, and to always be ready to try again. Fourth, cross-pollinate. That's like nutrition from REI. Diversity of thought is such an incredible driver of organizational and individual success, and people in different places think differently. After Charlottesville, I went to North Carolina, then Chicago, New York City, Washington, D.C., back to Charlottesville, and I picked up so many new and different ways of thinking along the way. You can find diversity of thought in one place, but you find a lot more if you look in new and different places. Don't be afraid to branch out or take advantage of the learning opportunities wherever they may be. And finally, lift as you climb. I'm talking about reaching back and lifting someone up who's on their way up behind you. Now this would be that provision of fire in REI's list. And it sounds like added work, it sounds like extra credit, but it's actually life bringing. You learn so much by looking back, by reaching back, and helping someone else along. That's one way that you can put your privilege, including your privilege as newly minted college graduates, to work by making life better for others. And after all, as Pharrell said yesterday, that's the only way to make life better for yourself. It also can give you one way to keep in touch with how far that you've gone, to give yourself that fire and that energy to make it on your next steps ahead. So be authentic, find mentors, iterate, cross-pollinate, and lift as you climb. I'm not saying that it's a sure thing for success, fulfillment, and a peaceful and happy life, but I do think that by keeping these concepts in mind, you really increase your odds for safety, survival, and basic comfort while you climb. Now, my time up here has long since run its course, and uh, you know, sorry but not sorry. They gave me the mic, so they messed up. <laughs> but I, I know that you guys have hats to throw and hugs to give. You have diplomas to receive and selfies to snap. So in closing, I just wanna share with you the great optimism that I have for you all as you move forward. We have so much to be grateful for in our lives, in our nation, and in our world. I want to lead with that because I believe it in my heart. In so many ways, people are living better lives all around the world today than at any previous point in human history. But I have to acknowledge the enormous challenges that we still face in our nation, in our world. Like how we face a crisis of economic mobility, how the chance is no better than a coin flip that you all will earn more than your parents did or how men continue to perpetrate absolutely unconscionable assaults on the physical and, uh, physical and policy assaults on the bodies and on the rights of women. How, how our failures to protect the environment not only endanger future generations, but endanger hundreds of millions of people around the world right now. How Unacceptable disparities in, in health, absolutely unacceptable disparities in health are persisting because of ongoing disparities and injustices in where we're born, grow, live, learn, eat, play, and pray. <laughs> Finally, how wealth and power remain concentrated in the hands of far too few and out of reach for far too many. But, but you know, there's a quote by Frederick Douglass, and it's that power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. And while you hear me run through that list of societal ills, I want you to remember what your parents and your professors and your employers have been saying all along. If power concedes nothing without a demand, power better watch out, because there's never been a more demanding generation than y'all. <laughs> so take that spirit and direct it towards something. The parents like them. So take, <laughs> take that spirit and direct it towards something positive, towards something productive, toward improving our society and mending unnecessary divides, toward being the change and building the world in which we should be living. Be slow to speak, but quick to listen. Be thoughtful, contemplative, and inclusive. Reject the notion that you have to play the game to be able to change the rules, but partner and plan well so that you can create new games that work for everyone. Because if you stand on the edge of your nickel and you capture the transformational power of the moments that await you, you can and you will accomplish anything. We've never seen the likes of you and the world will never be the same. So here's to you, the class of 2019, first of your names, kings and queens of the Wahoos and the first NCAA tournament champion, <laughs> lords of the bicentennial and protectors of the lawn.
And, and if you don't get that reference, you've got a lot of Game of Thrones to watch tonight. So thank you for all that you've done and all that you will do. Best of luck and journey well.